to be free to profess and to confess Jesus Christ. We have a great privilege here in America to speak about God openly and to proclaim him. You know, it seems to me that it's a reminder of this comes every day. Maybe your house is like my house, but it seems as though that I'm reminded of, of this, uh, the, the truth of the gospel and the freedom of the gospel and the mandate to give out the gospel that um, in my neighborhood and at my house, it seems as though the busiest traffic there is is either UPS or FedEx. And every day, there seems to be something at my door. When I get up, it's there. And, and I don't know what's inside because my name is not on the package. I just paid the bill. <laughs> but it's something that has been ordered. And uh, it's there. I can see it. The evidence is overwhelming that it's obvious. I can see it. But I've got to pick it up. I've got to bring it in the house. It's got to be unwrapped. I can see it. The evidence is overwhelming, but what I need to do is unwrap it and hold it in my hands and as it were, hold it to my heart. And of course, you know where I'm going. I've segued from that earthly example to the fact that you can see the Bible, you can read the Old and New Testament, but unless you pick it up and bring it into your heart, it is going to be something that is just simply theoretical to you. It's something that you might ponder in some form of a tower or palace or office. Listen, the Bible was designed to get out of that package. And that package is you and I. We are the package. As believers, we've got the gospel within us. And we are to unwrap ourselves, as it were, and let that gospel get out. And that gospel, of course, being not only the way of salvation, but when we talk about gospel, we must be careful. The Bible contains the gospel. Inside the Bible is the gospel, but the Bible is much more than the gospel. That's where you start. The gospel is the fact that Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins and rose again from the dead. That's the gospel. That if you believe on him, trust in him, you will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel. But after that is believed, what do you do? Well, that's the rest of the Bible. Disciple making. Becoming a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we pick up the word of God, as we will today, and I love the fact, I love how Paul thinks, I love how Paul writes, of course, it's the Holy Spirit using Paul, but how much does Paul lean into the Old Testament to make his New Testament argument is a delight to me. But mark this down if you would, I think we have it on the slide, it's, it's something you can either take a picture of or just uh, forget altogether, but I hope not. But um, the fact of the matter is, God's word in its entirety uh, I realized this, that when Moses spoke, he spoke the word of God. We can all say amen to that. That's obvious. Nobody would take issue with that. Our Muslim friends would agree. Our Jewish friends would agree. Well, of course, in Christianity, we agree with that. When Moses spoke, he spoke the word of God. When Samuel spoke, he spoke the word of God. When Isaiah spoke, he spoke the word of God. When Jeremiah spoke, he spoke the word of God. I like these last two. When God spoke... He spoke the word. When Jesus Christ speaks, he is the word of God speaking. The Bible makes that very clear. All of these things are tied together and you cannot separate them. The entire book is about Jesus Christ. Old and New Testament. There's one star figure who's manifested in so many different ways. Not only by his names given in the Bible... But the typology given in the Bible, those moments that are called Christophanies or Theophanies, where Christ, before he was born in Bethlehem, appeared in the Old Testament, he's all over. And he's the very one who, I believe in Genesis 1-1, when the word God, Elohim, in the beginning, Elohim, El, God, I am, Him, is a singular plurality. Right at the first chapter of the first verse of the book of the Bible, you've got to be introduced to the fact that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God in a singular plurality. Go figure that out. And when you've figured it out, let me know. Because nobody has been able to do it yet. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, beginning there, that in the beginning was the Word. That is the beginning of the physical universe. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Verse 2 says he was in the beginning with God. And verse 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I love that. The word flesh, became flesh, is the Greek word sarx, and it means bodily. Look, this is kind of cool. The Bible says that the word became flesh. It's unique. It's a miracle. Jesus, the word of God, became skin for us, physically, tangibly, like that package. You can see him. You can unwrap him. You can take him into your heart. Jesus. And what's communicated here is, listen, not only that he came in the physical realm, but I love this next part. The revelation of the Sarx, S-A-R-X, is that of personality. God revealed his personality in the person of Jesus. You want to know God's personality? You say, personality? I never heard about God having a personality. I don't know why you haven't thought about that, because have you not been created in the image of God? I told you before, it's, it's, God told me this years ago. Because in, my, in my, my new experience of finding Christ, I thought there's no way that God would love me. So I need to change myself on the outside. And I remember struggling with trying to be somebody else rather than me. I know you would never go through that. I, only I did. <laughs> I'd look at myself in the mirror and I couldn't stand myself because I would be reminded of my old life. And so I tried to be somebody different. And you know what God told me? God told me, Jack, I didn't die for your personality. I died for your sins. And let me tell you, that just shook me to the core and put a happy smile on my soul. Why am I a personality? Why are you a personality? Because God has a personality. And how, do you, how are you going to know that personality of who God is? What's he like? How does he conduct himself? What does he think? Well, the will of God is the word of God, and that has been revealed to us in the person of Jesus. You want to know what the Holy Spirit thinks? Look at the life of Jesus. You want to know what the Father thinks? Look at the life of Jesus. As he has revealed God to us. Jesus Christ is God's final word. This is all a big introduction to where we're going today. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says, God who at various times... And in various ways in time past spoke to the fathers by the prophets. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Mark this down. Christ is the inspired word. Jesus is the inspired word. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. All scripture. Think of this. I know we have a Bible and I know it's ink and it's paper and ribbons and leather. But this book is a communication system announcing to us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, which is very cool. Burn every Bible in the world changes nothing. I like that. He's not relegated to the book. He's not stuck in the book. This book tells us, proclaims to us who he is. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friends, listen. What a great promise that is. 2 Timothy 3.16 is proof positive, evidence, that if you pick up this book and you unwrap it and you put it into your heart, you have it ingested within you. You're going to have a life that's equipped to deal with this world and all the ministry that's needed from every single one of us today. Look, I know there's a lot of people here right now, but listen, think of this. There's much more people outside these walls in great pain and great hurt, needing great hope. And they don't even know it yet, but they're waiting for you to show up in their life. That's your mission. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Holy Spirit Every time you pick up a Bible verse and a chapter of the Bible and you read it, the Holy Spirit will take it and he wants you to exercise that outside the walls of your skin. And God goes to work. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16. You guys okay? I'm yelling at you because I'm making up for last week. 
I know, I saw the internet. The reports of my death were greatly exaggerated. <laughs> uh, I was reading all kinds of amazing things about myself. I didn't know. But uh, Dr. Frank was here, obviously, and that was incredible. I think we should just move him on out here. Don't you think him and Stephanie ought to move and just take up their residence in Southern California? I love that guy. But Jesus Christ is also the authoritative word. Jesus, the authoritative word. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Think about that now. Can I put it this way? The evidence was overwhelming on our doorstep. We saw with our own eyes, Peter says, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. And what did that statement make? What did God say? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And when he heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to take heed to as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy, that is revelation of scripture, is of any private interpretation. You know what that means, church? It means you can't make something up. What does that mean? You can't open up the Bible and say, well, this is what it means to me. You can't do that. You can do that about the newspaper. You can't do that about the Bible. You cannot have a private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's the authority. And then Jesus is also the living word. We know this. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says, For the word of God, that's Jesus, is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division and the soul of the spirit and the joints of the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You want to know why people freak out when they see a Bible and they don't know what it's about or they don't know Jesus? T- listen, today after service, take your Bible with you to breakfast, wherever you go. And just lay it down right there. Just put it on the... If you're going to go to the restaurant, put it right there. Or if you're going to drive through someplace, put it right there on your door panel. Watch the eyes of the person that's serving you. What is that? They may not ask what is it, but they'll look at it. And it's amazing. It's the Bible. Why do they act like that? Down deep inside, they know that that's the Bible. That book's alive, man. And uh, it gets inside of us. And if it's not inside of us, it tries to get inside of us by exposing ourselves to ourselves. The Bible is either outside of you trying to get in, or for those of us who are followers of Christ, the Bible is in us. It's awesome. And that Bible goes on to tell us that it's the piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow and the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Verse 13, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. Notice how it personifies the word, his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. Wow. And then we know that Jesus is the only word. He's the only word. Well, I'm just trying to get a word from God, brother. Read your Bible. What do you want? I want God to just write it in the sky, and then I'll know it's him. Yeah, hey, something a lot easier than that. Pick up your Bible and read it. You want God to speak to you? Pick up your Bible, start reading, and something will jump out of the Bible. And that something will be exactly what you need to hear, exactly what you need to have. Acts chapter 8, verse 4 says, Therefore... Those who were scattered went everywhere. They were believers. Persecution broke out. And what did they do? Watch. I'll tell you what they didn't do. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere filing grievances and held, I'm a victim sign. No, they took, they took the persecution that was against them, realizing this is more evidence. 
The attack that's coming against you as a believer is evidence of the truth that resides in you. And the Bible says this is their response, and it's got to be our response. They went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. It was not only all of them preaching, but then the Bible tells us that Philip himself went preaching. And when you read all about the disciples and the apostles and the followers of Jesus, that was the hallmark of their life, no matter what they were, is that they proclaimed Jesus. It's amazing. And then also this, empowerment. Jesus Christ is the empowered word of God. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. Wouldn't it be great if we had coordinate an earthquake the moment I read this verse? <laughs> the ground would start to shake. Let's see what happens, huh? Ready? Acts 4, 31 says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. <laughs> And they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. Watch this. So the Holy Spirit showed up, which was the answer to the ground shaking. It wasn't a timed earthquake in the manifestation of the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God showed up, there was a quaking, a manifestation, evidence. And look what happened. And I love this. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Wow. The power of God's word is transcendent, it's supernatural, it is today, I know this is a big statement, hang on to your seats, today, as it always has been, the word of God, this Bible, is the greatest power on earth. I'm telling you right now, you think a nuclear bomb can destroy this? Impossible. Terrorism? Impossible. Politics? Impossible. Impossible. You name it. Death, impossible. Nothing can stop this. You can detonate all the nuclear and atomic bombs in the world in one consecutive moment and it wouldn't change the truth of God's word. Everything might evaporate, but not God's word. Remarkable, awesome. Jesus Christ, the word of God, is our commissioning word. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Sounds like Genesis 1-1. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, or behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age or the end of the world. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And you shall receive power, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, to Chino Hills or wherever you live. And now when, they, when he had spoken these things, I love this. While they watched, he was taken up in a cloud, received him up out of their sight. And while they looked, the word in Greek is as they gawked. It means their eyes were wide open and their their mouths were hanging open. Jesus is going up and they're going. And they're, they're just absolutely captivated, of course. You and I'd be the same way. That while they looked at him steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Two angels, no doubt. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? I don't think that's a fair question. (laughs) Why not? That doesn't happen every day. (laughs) To angels, it's no big deal. The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come again in like manner as you have seen him go up into heaven. That's a promise that he's coming back again. That's remarkable. And then finally this one before we get into our study. You haven't even been in it yet. Is that he's the unstoppable word. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, And the word of God is not chained. Can't be chained. Paul was chained, but the word of God was not chained. It's amazing. So church, in this study, free speech, we saw in verses 5 to 7, that free speech is the great revealer. We looked at that already. And then listen, secondly, we saw in verses 8 to 10 that the free speech argument is the great reality. That is, in fact, the great reality. And we left off right here in the final argument of that. Mark it down if you would. It is the great reality, and it's in verse 10 at the latter part, and it is this, that let the truth be known. As believers, we are to let the truth be known. And look what he says in verse 10. For, number one, if you want to take notes about it, for with the heart one believes under righteousness. This whole thing about Jesus Christ being who all that we just said he was and is, is all a matter of the heart, a new heart. And the Bible here tells us that with the heart one believes under righteousness. This means that the core inside of who you are is now changed. That you have been either religious or non-religious. You have been theistic or atheistic. The point of the matter is there's been a revolution in your life. And listen, uh, you're no longer involved in churchianity. You're no longer in some, uh, you're no longer interested in any form of, of uh, club Christianity. You're done with all that. You're sick of it. You, you want to move now and in, in, in press into the very person who, of who Jesus is. And your heart has changed. God changes your heart. How does that happen? It begins in the heart. The awakening takes place in the heart. And that is the very seat of who you are. All bringing together your decision making, your repentance from sin, your faith in him. It's all a matter of the heart. And listen, as the heart believes under righteousness, number two, what happens is that the mouth makes confession unto salvation. What has gone on in my heart comes out of my mouth. You can't contain, you can't shut the mouth up when God has got a hold of your heart. This is a serious, it's so simple, but you know what? America is lacking this today. There are people by the tens of thousands, if not millions, go into church and out of church, and there's no sign of faith or belief or Christ in their life until next Sunday, and then even that's by osmosis, at best. Maybe association more accurately, where somebody will say, well, I go to Calvary. Somebody asks them about heaven or hell, and they go, I go to Calvary. You think that's going to work? Coming here could set you back a few notches. Anything outside the person of Jesus Christ, his atonement on the cross for my sins, I come to him completely bankrupt and I trust him with my soul and everything. And when I say everything, you know, we, we, we have a tendency to trust God for the big thing, you know, uh, my soul. And okay, that's great. But how are you doing with uh, trying to make ends meet this month? getting harder than ever. It's the, hardest, it's the hardest I've seen in, I think, my lifetime. Things were pretty rough in 1978, 79. Anybody remember that? Anybody old enough to remember <laughs> our war with Iran? Yes. Remember that? Yes. I say our war with Iran. Uh, that was a complete military debacle, if you remember what happened. We lost lives in the desert. It was terrible. Our good friend, uh, General, not General at the time, but uh, Delta Force was there. Jerry Boykin was there. Survived that. But uh, we, we, we got our tail kicked. And um, you may not remember that because you were busy at the gas station trying to get gasoline in, in your car. Do you remember that? Do you remember going? And some of the young people are like, what? We used to go to gas stations and we used to roll up our sleeves because you didn't know at any moment when the fight was going to break out. There'd be fights at gas stations because people were trying to get gas. And um, people would, you had to go based on your license plate. Odd and even number on your license plate. So guess what happened? Remember garden hoses? People were stealing gasoline from your car with a garden hose. ER rooms were starting to be filled up with people who had gasoline in their stomach because they swallowed it. 
And uh, the other thing is, is that um, people would steal license plates. And it was pretty bad. And it's, it's bad again. But the truth of the matter is this. In all of the things that are going on in this world around us, none of these things should move us. Because do you trust Christ for eternity? Do you really, really, really trust him when the doctor says you've got three months to live, but you can't trust him for the mortgage? You can't trust him for the light bill? Oh, I trust God for eternity. Oh my gosh, how are we going to pay the water bill? Listen, go to work. Work hard. And God will pay the water bill. How's he going to do it? I don't know, but he does. Put him first, he'll take care of everything else. It's very important you understand that. But with the mouth, confession is made. We need to speak up more and more like never before. Thank God. Thank God for the governors of Louisiana in Tennessee who are speaking up. <laughs> Ten Commandments. Prayer. Wow. We need to speak up. Confession is made with the mouth unto salvation. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21... I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Did you know that about you? You're no longer living. I'm no longer living. And I'm very grateful for this, by the way. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in faith, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate or set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. In other words, you trust him. He changes your heart and your mouth will open. You've got to tell the world. Number three in this is the free speech is the great redeemer, verses 11 to 13. Free speech is the great redeemer. When I say free speech, you know what I'm saying. I'm talking about preaching the word of God, letting it come out of your mouth. Tell people. We can talk about free speech. and As I said last time together, we automatically think about the Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. That's not what I meant. We're not talking about that. You can live in any country in the world. You can be watching this right now in any country in the world. And now it turns out I'm speaking in all kinds of languages now. That's amazing. I don't know if you've seen this. We hired an AI company. And uh, it's so crazy that when I'm speaking a foreign language now, the AI is so fast, it puts, it, it, it puts my lips to that language. So that if someone's deaf and, and they're watching TV, they can, they can hear the message by, by reading the lips. Is that amazing? That's the good part of AI. That's the, that's the good part. But uh, I just find it awesome. Listen, God wants his word so spoken everywhere that it's obviously clear that we're in the last days. The word is to get out everywhere. And what do we mean by this? We mean this in verse 11. Free speech is the great redeemer when redemption is available. God's word goes out, redemption's available. It says, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. His redemption for us and of us removes all shame. See this word shame? Let's look at it together. The word shame is a very powerful word. Disappointment. Listen, you don't even need to raise your hand. I was going to ask you, who has experienced disappointment? Every human being has been disappointed. Being disgraced. Have you ever been disgraced? You will not be humil... The word means in the negative. You will not be negative positive. You will not be disappointed. You will not be disgraced. You will not be humiliated. You will not be embarrassed if Christ is your Lord and Savior. And this is very clear. The great Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, our redemption is not only available to us, why would we dare keep that great treasure to ourselves? And when the Bible says that when the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Paul is doing none other than quoting the Old Testament scripture. Did you know that? I love this about him. He's quoting Isaiah. 
He's going to blend in some Joel in a moment. You'll see that. But put to shame. Uh, But listen to this. You know the Bible says, let them be ashamed and brought to confusion. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonored. All those who exalt themselves against God. Wow. Those days are coming. It not only happens on a small scale, so to speak, personally, but just think about all those who in our nation and our world has been shaking their fist at God and mocking him. God says to the wicked, you will be confounded and I will bring shame upon you. He will not be mocked, the Bible says. And I believe God is about to move in the earth. But in the meantime, you want Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior because, listen, church, you never want to be embarrassed, put to shame, or be disappointed. That's for all of us. None of us sign up for that. I want you to think this through, no matter who you might be right now. If you want to avoid embarrassment, shame, and disappointment, there's only one way. And it's for you to finally take a deep breath and fill up your lungs with some fresh air and think. Get that O2 to your head and understand that the only way to survive those things is Jesus Christ himself and him alone. Nobody else can do this for you. There's liberty in this. What do you sell? Is it metals? Is it cars? Is it fabric? Is it projects? What do you sell? Or who do you work for? Some, listen, every single one of us have worked for someone who sells something. Well, Jack, what are you selling? Nothing. <laughs> He's not for sale. He's for the having. How do I buy Jesus? Can't be bought. He's not a politician. Right? He can't be bought or bought off. All of the scandals that have been lied about concerning Jesus, they just bounce right off. You know, listen, people, you're going to be attacked. If you haven't been attacked yet, I don't know what you're doing. Maybe nothing. That's why you're not attacked. If you're going to stand up for Jesus, you're going to get ridiculed, made up, attacked. And the more you stand for Jesus, the more the attack. I was reminded of this the other day. It's Sprouts. (laughs) Sprouts. You know, with a name like Sprouts, you expect to get a hug when you walk into the building. (laughs) It's like, we're so happy to see you. Come on. Let me give you a hug before you shop at Sprouts. (laughs) And uh, I'm getting something, I forget what it was, it doesn't matter, and then some, this, this woman stops, and she almost starts crying. This happens a lot, by the way. I, apparently, it's really bad out there. I don't, no, seriously, I don't read, uh, you'd be surprised, I don't read uh, social media. I don't do it. So I'll make a comment about something, and then somebody says this, and then this group says this, and this, and the other, and this thing snowballs, and I'm not aware, I'm not aware of any snowball. And so this woman, she starts getting her chin is shaking. She starts getting filled with tears. And she's, I have to pray for you. It must be so hard. It must be so rough. All the things that are being said about Now she's got my curiosity going. <laughs> but I told her, I said, I said, thank you, but don't do that. I mean, I mean, go ahead and pray. But don't listen to that. Don't listen. Here's the thing. If I'm not worried about it, why should you? Here's the deal. Let him be your defense. Young people today, your young people today, you may not know this, but your kids are being involved in some way, shape, or form in the Snapchat, uh, Instagram, TikTok, you name it. If your kid puts their picture up on those things, have you seen what's happening to your child's face? They might be at a birthday party for grandma and they put their face on there and somebody in the uh, ethereal, invisible universe world of 
Social media will take your kid's face and put that kid in a compromised setting, photo, and then they get a hold of your kid because they can track that. I had an officer tell us, an investigator tell us how that happens. It's unbelievable. And they wind up wiggling their way over somehow meeting your kid, who you think just walks on water and would never do such a thing. But what is happening is what's being done to them by going social, and then somebody meets them somewhere because they know they're going to be there. They follow them. And they show them the picture of them in a compromised setting. I, uh, AI, they're in nudity or they're in some form of erotic setting. And they say, if you don't do what we say, we're going to tell your parents or we're going to post this to the, for the world to see. And it's not even true. Children. Satan is going after kids. If everything in the world that is evil is available, how about this? Let's make the salvation of Christ available. Let's let the news out of the bag. Jesus Christ is the one that cannot be contained. He cannot be hidden. And if the world is so bent on getting out ugly, evil, and danger by every means possible, how much more should we get the truth out by every means possible? In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says, Paul said, and I love this, this is to be galvanized as a believer. I'm not ashamed, for I, here it is, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. What a great statement that is. Do you know him? If you know him, you're going to be emboldened. How? The Holy Spirit will do that to us. We don't have to conjure that up. We don't have to drink Red Bull to go preach and teach. It's the Holy Spirit. And if you know him, then you've got to tell somebody. We need to get on out there and make redemption available. Tell the world. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 7 says, And he touched my mouth, Isaiah said. With it, he said, Behold, this has touched your, your lips, and your iniquity has been taken away, and your, and your uh, sin purged. That was the commissioning of Isaiah to go do the work of God. God says, come over here, Isaiah. He was a sinner. God says, let me tell you, I'm going to touch your life. And now that I've touched your life, you go tell the world. And he did. Verse 12 of our chapter here goes on to say, verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. I love this. No distinction. That word distinction means no dissection. I don't know, how do we get these things? How do we get the body of Christ so divided up when the Bible says there's no distinction, no void or gulf, no separation, no difference in oneness to those who are in Jesus Christ to the point of you being a Gentile or you being a Jew, if you believe that Jesus is Yeshua HaMashiach, there's no distinction. And we've got the Lutherans over here and the Baptists over there and the Assembly of God, and they won't talk to each other. I don't know what they're going to do in heaven. They've <laughs> got a big shock coming. Jesus is going to become walking by, holding a Methodist hand in an Assembly of God hand. What is that guy doing in here? He's a charismatic. <laughs> then the charismatic is going to say, what's he doing here? He's a Baptist. And the Lutherans are all going to be shocked. Hey, look. <laughs> You're not going to get to heaven by those titles, but you will go to heaven based on the title, and that is Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No distinctions with Jesus. Now, I want you to watch this. In fact, we'll, we'll put the verses up as close as we can together as possible. Watch how this goes. Colossians 3.11. Everybody watch. You guys awake? Yeah. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. You got that? Before we leave, there is neither Greek nor Jew. Next slide. There is neither Jew nor Greek. See the flip? Did you see that? I think the Holy Spirit did that. There is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, 
for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now listen, are there Jews? Yes. Are there Gentiles or Greeks? That's what that means. Yes. Are there males and females? Yes. There's the distinction that way. An elephant is an elephant. A giraffe is a giraffe. He's not talking about, can I say, elementary playground level of distinction. He's talking about stuff that matters. This doesn't matter. What matters is that in Christ, there are no divisions of value and of worth to God. We all come the same way to Jesus. We all come. And regarding those, and I'll just slip this in, regarding those who teach the heresy, somebody wrote me and said, you, call, you called me a heretic. That's right. I'm going to do it again right now. <laughs> People who hold to the twisted heresy of replacement theology, they can't even cope with these verses. They'll just skip right over it. You want to know why? Because the meaning, as I told you a moment ago, is at a meaning of no distinction on the matters that count. Not that, are you Hebrew? Are you a Jew? Are you a Gentile? That's not the problem. That is not a problem. God would probably say to us, I love it. Have you read the book of Revelation? He's all excited. The Bible says, in heaven, there are those who are of every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation in heaven. How do you see that? We said, I thought everybody was white in heaven. <laughs> You're wrong. You know what? Heaven looks like this place, by the way. There's every kind of color in every service of this church, and I love it. Heaven loves it. But you know what? This, I'm going to interrupt myself and mess myself up, so help me. Tell me where to come back to. When it says heaven, those that are there, those who have been redeemed, us, we there, it says every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation. When John saw that, he wrote it down. How did he know that? How did John know that there was every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation? John lived, he lived in Israel. He didn't travel anywhere. He might have gone to Lebanon for a little bit, maybe. Maybe, we don't know. He did eventually go to Ephesus, and he went, then he went to Patmos. He didn't travel much. How did he know that? He said, John, what are you seeing? Tell us what you see, John. Every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation. Can you be more specific? Zoom in. <laughs> wow. I see people with blonde hair. Very light skin. Those that are from the northern countries. And I see people that are just blacker than black. Tall, smooth skin. From the Africas or from the South Americas. There's another people group. And then there are those from Asia and the Orient. There are those from the Slavic. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I wonder. They had the fine white linen given to them. But I wonder, I wonder down deep inside, because don't you just love, when you, when you meet people from India, I mean, come on, let's, I'm sorry, man. We don't, we, we're boring. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go to Nordstrom's today and buy something really nice. <laughs> boring. <laughs> you want to meet, you want to meet awesome is, look at people from India who, I don't know what it's called, sorry, sorry, sorry. You know the wrapping, the colors, plus the food is amazing. We're going to eat. I'm sorry. I believe I'm going to eat that in heaven. If they're there, then I'm going to be with them. Heaven's going to be amazing. God's gospel goes out. And to the Greek, they're, they're, the Greek goes, yeah, right on. To the Jew, the Jew, listen, Judaism caused the gospel to be relegated and limited to the Jew only. They misread the gospel. They misread the scriptures. They said, no, it's for us and nobody else. God never said that. He said, it's for everybody. He wanted them to be the vehicle by which it went out. Amazing. Also this, received. When redemption is received, verse 12, 
For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. The same Lord. This excludes, listen, all cults got to go. In your mind's eye when you watch a baseball game, have you noticed that there are umpires who, you can't even tell sometimes when they call a strike or when the guy is out. They just go like this. And it's like, and then some of them, have you seen some of those umpires? They like go into this. I mean, he's not only out, he's out. And then the guy, the one umpire calls, he just goes, wait, wait, what was, what was that? Was that a ball or was that a strike? Listen, when the Bible announces to us that the same Lord is over all, this is talking about the absolute, undeniable, bold, without question, declaration being made. Jesus Christ is Lord. You don't whisper it. You don't go like this. You don't do hand signals. I mean, the picture ought to be a ship is sinking and and a rescue vessel comes up and shouts, this way! Grab the preserver, come to us! Jesus is saying that. He's the same Lord over all. And here's the thing. All the cults have a different Lord Jesus. Did you know that? I don't know if you know that or not. You have friends who are in the cults. What they did, your friend, you love them and you're going, I don't like what you're saying, Pastor. Listen, They don't believe in the same Lord Jesus Christ that's in the Bible. It's not the same. He's either created or he's some sort of a glorified angel or he's a glorified man. But he's not who the Bible says he is. He's the same Lord. This is a huge statement. It means that whoever Jesus Christ is, he's the Lord of the Old Testament and he's the Lord of the New. He's the same. The same. The absolute. I love that. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. Malachi 3 verse 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Numbers 23 verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man like us, that we should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I love that. And then when it says here, is he not uh, Lord, or for the same Lord overall is rich. The word rich, listen, this is great. Uh, Abounding in riches. I want to make this clear. He's abounding in riches. People are like, yeah? Mm -hmm." Becoming, or to become rich. I like it. To become wealthy, even more. To get riches, keep going, pastor. To make rich, I knew it. It Has nothing to do with money in your pocket. Has everything to do with spiritual truth and eternal reality. What, what, What do you... What do you invest in? What do you own? What do you have? We talked about that on Wednesday. No, listen, if you belong to Jesus, it doesn't matter what your bank account is. You are so rich in Christ. You have everything that he got for you at the cross. And then as we continue on, we're we're almost done, is I find this absolutely awesome, is the fact that the revelation of himself It's always been fascinating to me. Notice that the God of the Bible, can you write this down in your notes maybe as the prerequisite? Beautiful French-based word. The prerequisite. What preempts? What's preemptive of what God wants to say, what God wants to do? The God of the Bible. What's the big deal? Here's the big deal. He wants everyone to call upon him. Did you hear me? He wants everyone to call upon him. The God of the Bible. He's not saying, stay out. Don't call me. 
This is what he says. Psalm 145, verse 18. For the Lord is near to all who call upon him. Here's the thing. Will you? Or will your pride get in the way? To all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. Pretty awesome couple of verses. Next verse. Isaiah 45, verse 21. There is no other God besides me, a just God and Savior. There is none beside me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. Wow. Next one. Jeremiah 33, 3. I love this. <laughs> Jeremiah 33, 3. Listen to this. God says, call to me. I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. That's a great verse for a graduation, for a graduate. But you know what? Years ago, I forget who it was, said that's God's phone number. I wrote it down. It's 1-800-JEREMIAH-33-3. No, whoever it was, Dr. McGee or somebody said, that's, that's God's phone number. <laughs> Jeremiah 33-3 says, call me and I'll answer. Isn't that beautiful? I just put in the 1-800 part. That's 1-800-33, Jeremiah 33-3, call today. But wait, there's more. Have you placed the call? What is that call? Malachi 3, verse 16. I love this. Malachi 3, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. The word is awe. To those who are in reverential awe of God. They spoke to one another. I hope you as Christians speak to one another. I hope the moment that we say amen, God bless, goodbye, I hope you don't say, hey man, are you going to go watch the Rams play the goats this year or Whoever, I don't know, what, it, what season is it? I don't even know what it is. <laughs> hey, you, you know what I'm saying? Is it basketball? So are you going to go watch the Lakers lose to the whatever? I hope that's not what happens. I hope you wind up conversing with one another. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened. Hmm. You know he's listening. Did I hear my name? Yeah, they're talking. I listened and I heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Is that beautiful? And we end with this. Verse 13 says to us, for whoever calls on him, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is obviously the calling upon the Lord in salvation, meaning that you're trusting him. It doesn't mean you just say Jesus is Lord. It means it's actually in harmony with the life that is now inside of you. Do we fail? We fail miserably. But we don't have to have anybody point that out to us, do we? We know it ourselves. It's one of the evidences that we belong to him. But when we call upon him and call him Lord, it's the delight of our lives. And the Bible says, you shall be saved. Wow. When redemption is yours is what we're ending with. In Joel chapter 2, verse 32, it's what Paul's quoting. Joel 2, 32. For it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Church family, are you certain you have called upon him? All those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. Let's stand. But let me tell you what it does not mean. It doesn't mean, watch this. In fact, this, this would be some evidence for you that you've been radically deceived. I heard you, Pastor. I, I agree with that. I'll call upon him on, on, on my terms, when I'm good and ready. I'll call upon him when I have lived my life. 
Listen, you're probably one of those who are not even within the realm of being a child of God. You might be religious, but that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about the person who can say, Jesus Christ is Lord, I call upon him. And when you call upon him, it's the one that Paul said, I know who he is, but you must know who he is. You cannot say today, I, I call upon Jesus. Now, who is he now? Who, who? You cannot be saved if that's where you're at. Your sins cannot be forgiven and your shame cannot be taken away if you cannot define the Jesus you belong to as being biblical. Don't fool yourself. Have you called upon the name of the Lord? Do you know who he is? Because it is at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.